Today, technology recognizes no borders. Advances in technology and innovation have reshaped our world. Limited only by our imagination and ingenuity, technology has changed the way we live our lives. Even blurring boundaries between the virtual world and the physical world. Technology has connected us in ways that we never imagined. We can now chat with family members across the globe. We can attend meetings when necessary across time zones, even though it's much better to do so in person, as we all know. And we have seamlessly integrated digital technology and social media in all ways, in all parts of our lives. It has empowered us. Technology has empowered us, including many parts of our world and our world communities that have traditionally been excluded from innovation. Technology in many ways has moved our globe to greater equality, bringing understanding and education and opportunities to individuals who are all too frequently left behind. And while these advancements have removed borders and made our lives easier and more interdependent, they have also made us more vulnerable. You see, advancement in technology has burdened us, in a way, by providing a new global platform for illicit criminal activity. Criminals recognize no borders. We see that in our work each and every day. It's a concept that I've encountered in all of my years as a prosecutor, whether we're talking about the free flow of narcotics across interstate or international borders, fraudulent activity by corporate actors that is victimizing shareholders around the world, or in the case of cybercrime, and especially in ransomware activity. Our globalized, integrated world presents a target-rich environment now, where ransomware actors have found vulnerabilities at all levels and across all sectors. Indeed, there is a ransomware attack occurring on average every eight minutes. From accounting firms, to dentist office, to police departments, to local governments, to educational institutions, to our critical infrastructure. Our hospitals and our healthcare sector is particularly vulnerable as cyber criminals are using ransomware to block that hospital's access to its own patient's records and systems, halting diagnostic procedures. In recent years, the volume of these attacks and the size of the demands have skyrocketed. Reports of attacks to the FBI have seen a more than 200% increase in ransom amounts in 2020, with some ransom demands now exceeding $50 million. How are cyber actors doing it? They are deploying technology to target our vulnerabilities and to steal our personal information, our trade secrets, our banking data, and then extorting it for their own game. How are they doing it? They are improving their ransomware tactics, researching their victims now, identifying the victim's network the cost of business interruption, and even the amount of a victim's cyber insurance policy to extort as much money as possible. How are they doing it? They are employing sophisticated means to even avoid law enforcement detection, such as migrating to the dark web or using the Tor network to host sites and obscuring their identities to extort victims and potentially publish or even sell stolen victim Data. How are they doing it? They are oftentimes demanding that ransoms be paid in virtual currencies with concealed blockchains, especially designed to, devoid, to avoid detection and tracing. They are even innovating the business model of ransomware itself. Many developers are now offering what is called ransomware as a service licensing their ransomware to affiliates for a fee, 
where a typical arrangement involves the developers managing the ransomware, while the affiliates identify and attack the victims, and then what do they do? They split the ransom that they receive. They don't even need to be sophisticated cyber criminals anymore. Instead, they can license one and capitalize on the criminal activity of others. How are they doing it? The most common characteristic is this. They recognize no borders. Ransomware is a transnational crime. Cyber actors exploit infrastructure located around the world using a server in one country to disseminate ransomware, a server in a second country to house stolen victim information, an email account in a third country to negotiate with victims, and then a virtual currency exchange in a fourth country to cash out ransom payments. That is the challenge. So the question is, how do we respond? The answer is simple. It is plain. It is profound. We must respond in kind by recognizing no borders. That's why we're all here today, ladies and gentlemen, with representatives from the private and the public sector across our international community. This ransomware workshop brings together many experts with expertise from the front lines of combating cybercrime. In the fight against ransomware, there must be no borders between the private and public sector. I know we all agree with that, and I know that you will shortly hear a very passionate discussion about this in just a few minutes from my colleague from Germany. We welcome the insights from the partners in the tech sector on how collaboration between the public and private sectors can achieve our shared goals of prevention, sharing information, and supporting victims. In the fight against ransomware, there must be no borders between law enforcement and prosecutors. Just as prompt connection and collaboration between the public and private sectors leads to better outcomes, so too does early and ongoing engagement between law enforcement and prosecutors. And that begins with providing the right resources and the right training. In the fight against ransomware, there must be no borders between our law enforcement agencies across the globe. And frankly, I am grateful to the attorneys from our computer crime and intellectual property section, to the FBI, our international colleagues who have shared their experiences and their best practices and lessons learned in detecting and directing investigations to a successful outcome. Uh, as you know, very recently, the Department of Justice in response to an executive order by our president, President Biden, released a report setting out concrete recommendations on how best to strengthen international cooperation in combating digital asset crime. Working across borders allows us to support victims by promptly responding and working to make them whole. And while we have and must continue to utilize all available tools and authorities to disrupt criminal operations and deter offenders, working across borders allows us to utilize one of our most effective weapons. That is arresting and prosecuting wrongdoers in a court of law. That level of cooperation is absolutely critical because you see cyber actors operate from countries that they perceive as being safe and beyond the reach of extradition. You see, they rely on the separation that borders brings to them. But our international coordination, recognizing no borders in the fight against crime, leaves them no safe harbor. And this is why Eurojust, this is why Europol is so critical, bringing law enforcement and prosecutors and experts together from across the globe in one place, working shoulder to shoulder in building that level of cooperation and coordination. So my challenge to you is this. Use this convening to renew your commitment to that level of true cooperation, 
to sharing information and expertise, to stepping outside of the silos that oftentimes traps us in our individual agencies and institutions, to dropping what divides us and embracing what unites us, to recognizing no borders in our global fight against criminality. That is our challenge. That is our calling each and every day in our common mission. I look forward to working with all of you individually and collectively with no borders separating us, speaking the common language, the common language of justice. Thank you very much.